was 60 years ago that I first saw Canada, Canada's eastern shore from the observation deck of the Empress of Australia. I was 30 years of age and along with my German-born wife, Frida, we were new immigrants to this land from England. We had been at sea for 10 days because it was November and the crossing had been extremely rough. From the moment we left Liverpool, our ship was battered by gale force winds and gigantic swells that left most passengers confined to their beds overcome by seasickness. But for me, the trip was one great big adventure. So I was overwhelmed with joy to see land and meet for the first time this beautiful country called Canada, which would become my home for me, my wife, and eventually our three sons for many years. That day, I first saw Canada was the first chapter, a clear state of new begin beginning for both me and Frida. With the frigid Arctic wind backing my face, I felt invigorated and reborn because I had chosen to put down root, roots in a calling in a caring and decent country that believed in equality, inclusion, democracy, and merit. But like today, Canada in the 1950s was suspicious of newcomers who they considered potential threats to security. Since my wife still had family in communist East Germany, our British passports were stamped with a visa allowing us entry behind the Iron Curtain. For those flimsy reasons, our overzealous immigration officer in Montreal impounded our steamship trunks to ensure we were not smuggling das Kapital into Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I'd be outraged, but back then I was young and in strange surroundings, so I politely accepted the suspicion of freedom me with the stiff upper lip of a man who has known that ignorance and government uniforms are generally synonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we traveled by train from that day to Toronto with literally the shirts on our backs, I was glad to be rid of my past and thank Canada, Canada was willing to give me a chance to build a meaningful life for me and my family. However, by the time we left Toronto's Union Station and took a streetcar along, Queen Street, my exaltation was turning to anxiety because I didn't know anyone in Canada and except for a hundred dollars in my pocket, we didn't have any financial resources. I started to feel anxious as night wrapped around Toronto like I had done as a boy when my father was out of work and we didn't know where to turn because there was no social safety network. As our trolley took us to a rooming house in an affordable section of downtown Toronto, I stared out into this sleepy city that was my new home and tried not to think of my past which had led left sleep deep scars into the tissues of my soul. But how could it be otherwise? Because as I write in my book, Harry's Last Stand, a midwife with a penchant for gin delivered me into the arms of my exhausted mother on a cold, blustery day in February, 1923. 
I slept that night in my new crib, a dresser drawer beside her bed, unaware of the troubles that surrounded me, because my dad was a coal miner. We lived rough and ready in the hard scrabble Yorkshire town of Barnsley. Money and happiness didn't come easily for the likes of us. Considering the hunger, the turmoil, and the squalor in Britain during those early years of the 20th century, it was miraculous that I lived to see my third birthday, that I survived colic, flu, infection, scrapes and bangs without the benefits of modern sanitation, hygiene or health care. I must give thanks to my sturdy peasant genes. As a baby, I was ignorant of the great sorrow that erupted, enveloped England and Europe like a damp grey fog. The nation was still in mourning for her dead from the world's first great war. It had ended only five short years before my arrival. Nearly a million British soldiers had been killed in that conflict. It had begun in farce in 1914 and ended in bloody tragedy in 1918. In four years, that war killed more than 37 million men, women, and children around the world. Even when the guns were silent across the battlefields, were made dumb by peace, the killing didn't stop. Death refused to take a holiday, and the pestilence stormed across the globe. It was, the, it was called the Spanish flu. The pandemic lasted until 1921 and erased 100 million people from the ledgebooks of the living. Like most people in Barnsley, my family occupied a terraced house. They were built back to back and in a row of 10 units. There was little space, privacy or comfort for us or any of the other occupants. It was just a place to rest your head after spending 10 hours hacking coal from the side of a rock face hundreds of feet below the ground. Three walls out of four were connected to another household. The floors were made of hard slate rock and were sparsely covered with old rags that had been hand woven into coarse mats. The interior walls were comprised of wet limestone coated in a gruel thin whitewash that never seemed to look clean. In summer, our home was hot, in autumn, damp, and in winter, bitterly cold. While spring was as wet as autumn again, the house had no electricity and only, uh, sorry, our <laughs> house had no, we didn't have electricity in those days, <laughs> gas. <laughs> the, the house had no gas and the only power, and only in the power and scullery possessed the gaslight fuel fixture. After sunset, it sputtered and hissed a gloomy yellow light that illuminated our poverty. I shared a room with my older sister, Alberta. We slept together on a straw mattress that was not, that was the host to many insects and reeked of time and other people's piss. <laughs> its covering was made from a rough material that was uncomfortable to me as the, the occasions when my father tickled my face with his mustache. Depending on the season, I slept in my undershirt and remained fully clothed during the cold months. 
All those who and I nestled together and shared our body heat to stave off the chill and frost beating against the window pane. Our parlour had no furniture except a stool and an upright piano that had come as part of my dad's legacy from his father. But it stood mute against the wall because the room was occupied by my infirm and dying early sister, Marion. At the age of four, she had contracted tuberculosis, which was common, a common disease among our class. Her ailment was caused because my parents were compelled to live in a disease-ridden mining slum at the end of the Great War. Eventually, my parents were able to leave the slum, and by then, the damage had already been done to my sister's health. The TB spread into her spine. It left her a paraplegic with a hunchback. For the last 12 months of her life, Marion was totally dependent on my mother to be fed, bathed, and clothed. In those days, there was no national health service. You either had the dash to pay for your medicine or you did without. Your only hope for some medical care was the council poorhouse that accepted indigent patients. As a young lad, I was encouraged by my parents to spend time with my ailing sister. I think it was because they knew that she was dying and they wanted me to remember her for the rest of my life. I didn't comprehend illness or death because I was only three at the time. So I contented myself with playing near her sickbed. On some occasions, I told her nonsense stories, but my sister couldn't respond 